for downloading this podcast. My name's Richard Rucroft. You're listening to Gnostic Lectures. This is episode 27. And the title is Gnosis and the Arts. My host today, Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. How are you, Jim? Well, how are you, Rick? Thank you again for inviting me to be here today. Um, you asked me before we started the recording to uh, give my interpretation of what art means. And I told you, and I'll just reiterate for our listeners, that for, for me, art means something brought from the other dimensions. We are multidimensional beings living in a multidimensional universe. And the artist brings something from another dimension. And let me give you an example. Nikola Tesla was an inventor. He saw in his mind's eye, in the mental plane, in another dimension, the machinery already working, the inventions already made. Uh, some of the great artists in music, like Beethoven, uh, hear the complete symphony in their minds, and they bring that into the physical world. So these are artists, even in dowsing. We are in connection with higher intelligence, and so our dowsing is bringing information from other dimensions. Even um, the a person who's sitting in front of an easel uh, looking at a scenery, a, a scene of a, um, a mountain. The mountain is there physically, and one would think that there's nothing uh, being brought from other dimensions, but really there is. Because that artist is bringing feelings and emotions and something of that mountain scene that is not physical. It's bringing that into the painting. And so when you ask me, you know, for what is my interpretation of an artist or art? That's what I come up with. So what do you think? Yeah, well, I would agree with that. I do really agree with it. Um, well, the title again is Gnosis and the Arts, which is uh, we're trying to describe a perception of the arts through a Gnostic angle, a Gnostic perception of reality, which is not you know, isolated from the universe and isolated from us, on the contrary, is going deeper and deeper within each one of us. Because Gnosis is, according to the meaning of the word, means knowledge in Greek language. We find that word within diagnosis in medicine, or even politics, or even economics. So, essentially, you know, Gnosis is knowledge based on experience. And now, again, you describe art, and my perception of art is the constant search for beauty and perfection for everyone. You can be an artist, or you can do something else. You can be a cook, you know, and you would love to, do a, to make a masterpiece regarding a delicious food, you know. And, and there are many people say, you know, the art of cooking. So you can apply that conception into every field that we experience every day in life. So coming back into gnosis or knowledge based on experience, well, there are all, many kinds of real, uh, we call it knowledge, when there is theoretical knowledge, you know, we're reading books, you know, we go to universities, we memorize a text, we pass exams, sometimes without experiencing what we are saying. And we maybe get degrees, you know. And do we really deserve those degrees if we never experience what we learn, what we believe we learn? What about practice of theory? Well, that's better. We, if we practice what we learn theoretically, we will learn more. Now, if, when we see the results, we will learn much more. What about the experience? And this is extremely important because... All laws of the universe already known, like the law of gravity, is already tested and experienced in all levels. All of us, without being a scientist, we all know that if we drop something in the air, it will fall, you know, sooner or later in a certain period of time because of the law of gravity. So the repetition of those phenomena, falling, 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 create the law. And this is extremely important. Now, when we experience something deep within ourselves, something that we didn't know before, and now we learn something from life, 
This is something sometimes not very easy to be explained, but it is our own experience. For example, you know, if we go into religion, is religion an art? Well, why not? If we're searching for beauty and perfection, and we say angels are beautiful, God is beautiful, God is perfect. Of course, we are talking about an artistic perception of religion, and according to Gnostic anthropology, there are two extremes within religion, which are religious fanatic individuals, and the others are the atheist. Jesus Christ described them, you, you, we already mentioned that in the past. Religious fanatics are the Pharisees, who say they believe in the divinity, but their perception of the divinity is that of a God who is always angry, you know, creating uh, violence, you know, uh, and God also punishes us when we make mistakes. And on the other side, the atheist who also believe that the divinity has no reality. And this is, of course, not based on experience. Both are incomplete in their perception, and of course, that makes them wrong. So, knowledge, again, knowledge, gnosis, a Greek perception of reality applied into our modern time, knowledge based on experience applied into religion should then, should be then, I have to learn to know the divinity instead of believing in the divinity, learning to know God, learning to know myself. That's the most important thing. Knowledge and self-knowledge. And this is curious because in ancient times, the ancient Greeks, before Jesus Christ came, in the temple of Delphos, there was an, a sentence printed outside that said, O man, know thyself, and you will know the gods and the universe. So that, this is extremely important, you know, because some people will say, oh, the Greeks lived so long ago, you know, we know better than they do, that they did. But according to Gnostic anthropology, you know, we say sometimes the Greeks were better than we are today because they developed democracy, they had no slaves, you see, and today, in our modern times, we develop a slavery, and sometimes we call certain regimes, you know, democratic when they are not. There are, when there are dictatorships, from the right wing or the left wing, both pretending to be democratic, but this is modern slavery also. So the Greeks were more advanced when they created democracy, and when they said, O man, know thyself, and you will know the gods and the universe, they refer, they refer to what the Bible says, that we are all made on a perfect image of the divinity. How can we describe that, you know? If we are searching for beauty and perfection, imagine the galaxy. Does it mean that I'm the galaxy? We are the galaxy? Are we a perfect replica of the galaxy? In a tiny little perception in a tiny little manifestation, which is our organism. What if we are a perfect replica of our own galaxy, the Milky Way? What if every atomic particle that we carry within represents every planet of the galaxy? The only problem is these tiny little particles are dark. They are not illuminated. They are not enlightened. Because we are sleeping 24 hours a day. We haven't awakened our consciousness. What we said before, we are subconscious, unconscious, infraconscious. But what if we learn to illuminate ourselves? Wouldn't we become closer to a perfect replica of the universe? So if I know myself, would I be able to know the universe also? When the ancient Greeks spoke about their ancient gods, are not they the same angels and archangels of more modern religions? Of course they are. So this is an interesting way of perceiving reality. So when we speak about art, which is searching for beauty and perfection, we're not searching for something which is not real. Because all religions teach the same principle. They can differ 
regarding their religious institutions and they create artificial disagreements when in reality the principles are always the same. We have to try to also understand that in our search for beauty and perfection. When we speak about the absolute, the homeland of the spirit, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of all beginnings and the end of all ends, we said before that we all descended from the absolute as spiritual beings. We were planted within the universe. We were provided with vehicles to move within the universe. We were provided with matter. So we became then a combination of spirit and matter. And you see the, ma the masculine aspect of life and the feminine aspect of life. Isn't that, you know, that manifestation of life, isn't that connected with the majesty of beauty and perfection within everything surrounding us and also within ourselves? So we could speak, you know, about different art forms like music, dance, opera, theater, filmmaking, writing, acting, editing, you know, painting. And now I would love to spend some time talking about drama and public speaking because I've been learning also myself the dramatic arts for many years, uh, mainly to improve our capability to communicate better. Because, you know, the situation is many people believe that drama is a not very respectable you know, approach into life. People say, oh, you dramatize too much, you know. It's like making people lower than what they should be. And, oh, you're an actor. Oh, so you're not in... Yeah, come on, you know. Find a job, you know. Find a serious profession. And public speaking, you know, there are many people who enjoy speaking and they do it very well, but they, they tell you a lot of lies. You know, phony speakers who don't tell the truth. But this is the interesting part of dramatic art because there is a superior kind of dramatic art and this is what I've been trying to learn and also share with other people. I've been teaching, for example, a Stanislavski method called method acting in Hollywood and doing my research about that for the last 40 years or more, I realized that Konstantin Stanislavski, who lived in Russia, and he was, you know, the founder. Uh, he owned, actually, the theater of the fine arts of Moscow, and he developed this technique. He wrote many books about it, and there are many, you know, lectures and classes that he gave in Europe. He concentrated, concentrated in Paris, and he was training people from all over the world, many of them Hollywood people who traveled there, but only one American person learned with him. She, she was a lady, Estella Adler. Estella Adler, she knew personally Konstantin Stanislavski in Paris, France. So coming back into where Stanislavski learned all this mysterious kind of knowledge about a superior kind of dramatic art, he learned from Shakespeare, who lived 500 years ago, who wrote beautiful plays, incredible masterpieces, considered masterpieces, and we will explain why. But now, through my own personal research, I went into the past. Why Shakespeare spoke about this, and where did he get some of his inspiration to write his magnificent plays? He learned from the Greek theater, so we are coming back into Gnosis again. Gnostic anthropology and the arts are part of Gnostic anthropology. So the Greek theater was part of it. The Greek theater, you see? So when Stanislavski learned and developed his Stanislavski method, in reality, he was trying to bring into our modern times the incredible knowledge that the Greeks developed through dramatic arts. The incredible search for beauty and perfection through the arts, through dramatic arts. 
So when Hollywood developed the same technique, and they, they call it method acting, there was someone, you know, Mr. Lee Strasberg, who created the actor studio in New York, and many others, you know, Stella, Stella Adler, that we mentioned before, who studied with Stanislavski in France, in Paris. They were working together at the beginning, especially when they saw Stanislavski acting with a theater company from Europe, acting on the stages of New York. And they were extremely impressed because what they saw was an incredible, majestic kind of art where they saw realism. They saw actors performing a story, performing a dramatic play where every character was so real, so believable, so realistic, so connected with all of us, with the entire human race. They didn't see phony characters. They didn't see people pretending. They saw something that we, we have called through the time magic realism. Magic realism had been also brought into writing. You know, many, many incredible poets and people who are writing novels, who have won Nobel Prize of Literature, they also developed this approach into the arts and literature and the dramatic arts called magic realism. Because in reality, life is also magic. When we bring a child into the world, it's an ed that experience, seeing a newborn child coming into the world, isn't it something magic? When the baby smiles to us, don't we feel the magic of life? When we watch a sunrise or a sunset, isn't it also some kind of magic? When we're immersed within the forest, watching the beauty of nature, rivers, lakes, birds, you know, all kind of animals running through the forest, all kind of beautiful species. You see, isn't it magic also? And this is why, you know, searching for beauty and perfection is up to us. Some people maybe don't care about doing this, but sooner or later we will do it. You know, many people who've been busy all their lives concentrated and working, 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 others making money and more money and more money, suddenly they become old. Now they are 80 or 90 years of age, they cannot even walk. And they are invited to go to the forest where they are grandchildren. And now they realize that they've been missing all that beauty and perfection of the universe manifested here on Earth. And they realize that they were wasting their lives, disconnected with their families, Instead of giving them more and more love and affection, they ignored that because they concentrated in doing other things. So they missed that possibility of awakening within themselves, that love for nature and love for beauty and their search for perfection that we all carry within, but something we never realize it. So we could say that the Greek theater, and this is why you know, this is interesting to know. The Greek theater had a big difference with our actual dramatic art. Because the Greek theater had a purpose, which is the purpose of Gnosis. What's the purpose of Gnosis? What are we doing here on Earth? Aren't we here to awaken our consciousness? What's the meaning of the word consciousness? It means soul. So the bridge between the spirit and the mind and the body. Soul consciousness is the bridge between God, between the universe, and between our mind and our bodies and our emotions. You see? And this is the purpose of being here. We are here. When we are awakening consciousness, of course, we develop our capability to perceive beauty and perfection better than other people when we care about that. So coming back then into Stanislavski, who learned from Shakespeare, and let's talk now about method acting, Hollywood. You know, let's talk about Shakespeare a little bit. He lived 500 years ago, and he applied the Greek theater 
approach into reality, which is doing dramatic arts, writing in a poetic manner those magnificent plays, but teaching us a lesson through those magnificent plays, teaching us a lesson about life. If we look for a common minimum denominator in all Shakespeare plays, we realize that he normally concentrates into analyzing the psychology of people in position of power, kings and queens, aristocratic families, and manifesting, expressing all their comedies, dramas, and tragedies. You know, if we, for example, you know, in one of those plays, there is a, a king who said, my kingdom for a horse. He was desperate, losing a battle, and he knew he was losing his kingdom. But he needed a horse to walk away from the war, from the battlefield, because that was the only way to survive. And maybe he could have the chance to rebuild his empire. And he was losing his empire. So a horse became more important than his kingdom. A kingdom, a, a horse for my kingdom. The kingdom wasn't important anymore. You see, allowing me to tell you to discover which play was that. But what about, you know, another one where the prince of, of uh, another kingdom in Europe, he was also terrified about his own personal experience when he discovered that his father died and he realized that his father was killed, assassinated by whom? Enemies. Who were those enemies? He couldn't believe that his own uncle, the brother of his father, in a conspiracy with his own mother. Now, I, I will allow me to tell you the name of that play, Hamlet. The prince of Denmark realized the horrible, the horrible drama and the horrible tragedy of his father being assassinated by his own mother, the wife of his father, and by his own uncle, the brother of his own father. And of course, he wanted revenge. When he was thinking about destroying everything around him, he realized and he was asking himself, am I a villain? Am I a villain? Because, of course, he wasn't a hero anymore. Am I, am I a bad guy? Am I a demonic individual? I'm becoming evil because I want revenge. And he was watching a human skull on his hand because he understood that the mysteries of life and death are something to be explored. And within all this drama and tragedy, there was an inner beauty, very hard to describe, but there was a search for perfection. And he realized that what he was experiencing was a, a horrible drama based on a horrible tragedy, the death of his own father. You see, Shakespeare really concentrated into this kind of stories. It's up to you if you want to know more about Shakespeare. I'll, allow me to invite you to do it. But now let's come into more modern times, method acting, you know, Stanislavski learned from Shakespeare also. And then Hollywood imitated Stanislavski because this is the real reality. Hollywood didn't invent the method. Hollywood learned from Stanislavski and learned from Shakespeare. And also they learned from the Greek theater thousands of years ago, before Jesus Christ. The only problem is through the centuries, we started to ignore more and more important elements of the Greek theater, which main purpose again was Gnostic art, which is awakening consciousness through the practice of the arts. What do we mean with that? When we are awakening consciousness, we're searching for the truth. Some people say, oh, there are millions of different kinds of truths, you know. Everybody has its own personal truth. Allow me to say I disagree with it. Do you know why? Because, you know, when we discovered the law of gravity, 
don't say that there are billions of kind of different kinds of gravity. No, there is only one law of gravity. Everybody can experience gravity as a collective truth, universal truth. You see, and also if we get out of planet Earth, we can float within space. There are different cosmic laws out of the planet Earth, but within every planet, not the moons, because the moons are different. The moons don't have this attraction from within because the moons are dead planets. But every planet where, where there is life, like our planet, there is gravity because within the center of the planet, there is a liquid fire and that liquid fire is a magnetic force and that magnetic force is alive. And that magnetic force will make everything fall into, you know, into the planet. The law of attraction, you see, which is everywhere in the universe. So then, if we're searching for the truth, let's talk about the common ground truth. A truth for everybody, not only for myself or someone else. A collective truth. So searching for that truth you know, is connected also with exploring the many possibilities of finding beauty and perfection everywhere, which is exploring the arts field. So, coming back, you know, into Hollywood again, Estella Adler, the lady who went to France, Paris, and knew personally Stanislavski and learned the Stanislavski method, through the master there, according to Marlon Brando, who studied with her, she was the only American who did all the complete work on meeting the master and developing that technique. Because after you learn that technique, it opens mysterious doors to explore the arts. And through my personal experience, I've been teaching this technique to not only to actors, also to politicians, people, community leaders, people who enjoy speaking to the audiences, teaching to dancers, and they, they've been telling me that they, they learned to dance better than before. There was more concentration, more love for the arts, more respect for beauty and perfection, and also ma many other kind of people. One of my students became a writer after he took my course, and I don't want to be arrogant, but that student wrote the book and dedicated the book to my school of drama. That book is being published. If somebody would love to know about it, you know, the title of the book is Psychology of a Hero's Soul. And you can find it in many libraries or in the internet. And that book speaks about how Stanislavski method or method acting influenced his life in such a way that when he was becoming negative about himself, this technique taught him to be always positive, always creative, to learn to fall in love with nature, with life, with every day, to see the light at the end of a tunnel, because this is exactly the search for beauty and perfection everywhere. Even in a bad moment, we can learn from that experience. And of course, the purpose of life, which is awakening our consciousness, is always there. Consciousness means also light. Where there is more light in the universe, there is more consciousness, according to Gnostic principles. So, you see, again, again, it's extremely important that we all learn, sooner or later, to know, learning to know, but through experience. Let's stop believing. Oh, I believe in this because this gentleman said so. Oh yeah, I also believe that, believe this. I have known many people through my life experiences that, for example, regarding religion, this is an important topic. I met people 20 years later who believed in the divinity. And because they suffered so much the last 20 years, now they stopped believing. And the opposite experience, people who didn't believe in the divinity, and because they suffered so much, now they started to believe. What is this, you know? It, it proves that, and it shows that believing is never strong enough. What we really need to know, to know 
knowledge through knowing, through experience, than just believing. When you are a believer, you are a follower. Instead of learning to become a leader, learning to be leaders of ourselves, because the real leader is never outside. The leader is always inside. It's our own genius within. We all have a genius within. Albert Einstein spoke about that. He said we are all geniuses, potentially, of course. And we all have to explore the genius within. But if we speak from a religious angle, we should say the divinity lives within ourselves. So that's the real leader. And we should learn to become the second in command, to stop being followers. So what happened in Hollywood regarding method acting that was, you know, imitating Stanislavski method. There was a confrontation between Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg, Lee Strasberg who created the actor studio. Lee Strasberg did a good job because through the actor studio he trained people like Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Mary Streep, Jody Foster, Dustin Hoffman, Sean Penn, you know, Marilyn Monroe. Some people criticize Marilyn Monroe because they said she committed suicide, but in reality, if we study her career as an actress, she was an amazing good actress. There was a moment that she was invited to act in Europe in a movie with Laurence Olivier. Laurence Olivier was a legend, you know. He was considered an incredible good performer. But you know, when Marilyn Monroe was acting with him, Marilyn Monroe stole the show, not only in Europe, everywhere. She proved that Stanislavski method or method acting was much more powerful than just having a presence on stage or before the cameras. It was more than just vanity and looking good and speaking with elegance. It was much more than that. It was portraying a soul, having a soul, having a depth within each one of us, exploring within our own inner, inner real beings that most of the time we never know in a lifetime. You know, there was a confrontation between those who believe in Stanislavski and those who decided to walk away from Stanislavski. And, you know, the actor studio made changes to Stanislavski method. And even they did a great job. We cannot deny that because good actors like Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Mary Streep, Jodie Forster, Dustin Hoffman, Sean Penn, you look at them and they become unforgettable. You remember the movie because you saw that good actor telling moments of truth. We could all interrelate to it. When those people were crying real tears instead of pretending, when they were really angry because they felt abused or they were suffering or they were happy, they transmitted that to the audiences. You know, and these people, if we're talking about business, they brought more profits into Hollywood than any other movie. So there was a big difference between these kind of characters and the actor who only, you know, was happy with pretending. Very superficial, soulless characters. So that confrontation between Stella Adler and Lee Strapper is interesting to understand it because Stella Adler was closer to Stanislavski and also closer to the Greek theater which is awakening consciousness. What do I mean with that? That when you make a movie or when you write a book and you show the confrontation between heroes and villains, if we make the villain want the villain to be the winner and we giving an influence to the world that nothing is wrong, you see, we can commit all kinds of crimes. We can be a serial killer and at the end, well, so what? It's okay to be a villain then. And there you see a lot of movies coming into the market where there are no heroes. There are anti-heroes, a different kind of character. So only villains fighting with villains. And who wins the smartest villain? The one who stole the bank and killed all the other partners and appropriated the profit for himself, herself, or simply he pushed them into the arms of the police. So they were all arrested except the one who appropriated all the funds. And of course, the audiences were influenced to believe that that was okay. 
So there was no confrontation between heroes and villains. That was the lesson regarding awakening consciousness. Well, according to an objective perception, then there is no hope. It's okay to be a bad guy. It's okay to be a criminal. It's okay, you know, to do wrong things without respect for cosmic laws, without respect for the law of cause and effect. You see, it's like, who cares? I will die, I was a bad guy, and I will come back with another body later. So, well, let's have fun as long as we can, you know. Or let's believe that there is only one life and I can do whatever I want. And it's okay, you know. I can be abusive, I can be a dictatorship, I can kill millions of people through a World War I, World War I, World War II, World War III, all kinds of atrocities to torture people. And it's okay. Yeah. Villains, you know. So that makes us convince ourselves that we live in a planet of villains. And where are the heroes? <laughs> Can we count them with only one hand? What about the founders of all religions? You know, maybe they are the only heroes. I remember someone, some people considered important, have said, oh, the only Christian person that I know was Jesus Christ. Somebody said that, you know, I, I'm not going to mention his name. He's considered a respectable individual within, you know, esoteric studies. Now, so coming back into this, you know, we could say that method acting really did a good job compared with mediocre performance performances. They did a good job. But then those who study Stanislavski, because in Europe, European actors, European actors really, they pay more attention to Stanislavski. Stanislavski was more concerned about giving a lesson to humanity that would teach us to have a better life. Instead of creating hell on earth, let's make an effort, at least an effort, to bring peace instead of war, to glorify peace instead of glorifying war. Even, you know, repentance. I'm a bad guy, and at the end of the show, I repent. I decided now to improve whatever I can give as a legacy to those who are coming after me. You see, so the villain becomes a hero because the meaning of the word hero, this is interesting, is a Greek word. The real meaning of the word hero is connected with serving and protect. And who can, can have the power to serve and protect? Superior beings, of course. Even, you know, the Canadian police used that sentence to serve and protect. Because based on justice, you know. What about political corruption, you know? What about police corruption? Do you see the point? So these are elements to be considered regarding the perceiving reality of heroes and villains. So from an esoteric point of view, a real hero is the one who defeats his own demons, his or her inner demon that we all carry within, our own ego. That's a hero. And a villain is the one who is happy with his ego, you know. Oh, yes, I'm better than anybody else, you know. I am a winner. I was born to be a winner. And if you don't let me be a winner, you are dead. I'm ready to step on the head of everyone to become the owner of planet Earth. And some people are doing that, you know. Some people have done it in the past. And this is why Shakespeare was really describing how kings from the past, you know, did all of that. This is why the monarchies collapsed. There are still monarchies on earth, but, you know, they don't have the power that they used to have. They've been replaced. Now, the situation is now coming back into this Hollywood and European actors. If we compare, you know, the training of some European actor like Anthony Hopkins, a British man, Gary Oldman, another British man, Daniel Day-Lewis, another British man, have you seen them? You know, I have seen them. I have been studying them. When you see Anthony Hopkins, you see a depth so tremendous. So tremendous. When he performed an evil character in The Silence of the Lambs, the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist who was a cannibal, he killed people and he ate them after that. That was a horrible, a horrible monster portrayed by an actor. But the interesting part this horrible monster that lived in a jail 
From there, he was a psychiatrist. He was teaching another young psychiatrist working for the FBI how to capture criminals <laughs> because he knew the psychology of a criminal better than the police. He, he was capable of portraying a perfect image, the perfect ego of a monster because he was a monster himself, but he had the capability to share that knowledge without any shame. It's like he felt some kind of sympathy for this young psychiatrist working for the police, for the FBI, and was helping her to capture other criminals. Incredible, yes, but people who wrote, created those characters, they said they were based on reality. Well, there we can see that is a strong connection between drama and reality itself. So let's come back now into this European actors and Hollywood actors. Anthony Hopkins has, has moved to Hollywood now. He's acting. And when you compare his performance with other kind of performances, you cannot deny your admiration for an individual like him because he's so powerful, he's so realistic. And also, he's capable of doing what, Rick, you said, to go into a parallel dimension and to bring us the horror of Inferno <laughs> through his eyes. You could see hell. He was a habitant of Inferno and he brought that into the audiences of the world. Can I ask a question? Of course. Is Anthony, uh, we're picking on Anthony Hopkins, but it could be any actor, uh, is a very good actor like that coming in contact with their ego, the ego of the cannibal, okay? And isn't that kind of something like Gnostic people should be annihilating their ego? Well, allow me to, allow me to explain it in a different, from a different kind of perception. You know, evil is not only individual, it's also collective, you know? This is why the Bible speaks about the ap apocalyptic beast. It's the collective ego of humanity. So when he's performing that, he's not performing himself. He's performing someone else. And a true artist who is working on the annihilation of the ego should be able to perceive his own dark side. So what you're, what you're saying is the Gnostic person who goes through the process of, of meditation and annihilation of the ego, once that has been accomplished and continues to be accomplished, then that person can portray the evil better because he understands it better. Is that correct? You know, I love, yeah, of course. But you know, don't... Don't be so optimistic because we, we shouldn't say somebody who already annihilated the ego mm -hmm. is someone who is struggling against himself yeah. to annihilate his ego. And in the process of doing it, he's helping others to do the same. Yeah, okay. You see, he's teaching, he's sharing. But you know, according to Gnostic anthropology, and we could also say Gnostic philosophy, and, you know, trying to understand the process of ascension, trying to understand Jesus Christ or Moses, superior beings like him. You know, there are superior beings being described, you know, that live on earth. They speak about the immortals, masters who are immortals and masters who are mortals. And this is why, for example, they speak about the Count Saint Germain. And also they mention another name, Cagliostro. Well, Samael Anveor, the founder of Gnostic anthropology, Gnostic cosmology, and Gnostic psychology, he describes in, in his books experiences of superior beings, immortal beings who live on earth, people who ascended thousands of years ago. They used to be living Buddhas, and now they learn to become higher than living Buddhas. We could say Christify themselves. They became immortals thousands of years ago, Saint Germain and Cagliostro. These two masters belong to the ray of politics and economics. They were very much involved, you know, with human history. And there was a moment that, you see, these superior beings who have the power to appear and disappear and also create a character. They create a character on Earth. They say, for example, 
the Count Saint Germain, he's the one who donated to the city of New York the Statue of Liberty. Pretending to be, not pretending, but living, <laughs> living the character of a billionaire, a European billionaire, a mysterious individual, surrounded by a lot of people, and he's the one who donated that Statue of Liberty to New York. With which purpose? To teach with that Statue of Liberty that the Americans should never forget that when they got the independence from England, from the British Empire, they, were, they had the right to struggle for freedom, for liberty, you see? And, and that was the purpose when he did that. Now, today, are the Americans following the same purpose of their own lives? Is that statue really helping them? In many cases, yes. In many other cases, the dark forces, you know, that live within ourselves and also live within, within and also outside, they become collective dark forces. Of course, make us forget again, you know, are we a planet of villains or what are the real heroes? So these superior beings, they have annihilated the ego, but they continue, you know, they continue being part of our lives to help us. Sometimes they have to immerse within a task, which is not nice. Even they have to participate in a war. Apparently, they've been stopping the World War III. They've been blocking the possibilities for the World War III. That could have become already, at this time, a nuclear holocaust. But they've been doing it. You know, Joan of Arc, according to Samaela Unveor, she reached immortality after she was burned alive. I mean immortality of the physical body. I'm not talking about immortality of the spirit. The spirit is always immortal for all of us. Even if we're baby spirits, we are immortal baby spirits. But superior beings are not baby spirits anymore. They have ascended. And Joan of Arc was already a reincarnated Buddha. She was mortal when she reincarnated. And after she portrayed that incredible performance, the drama of France being imprisoned in their own country by the British Empire, by the British monarchies at that time, she came to help France to get freedom from the monarchy of England at that time. And she participated in the war. So there you can see, wars are not good. Wars are always evil. But when you are fighting for freedom, you have the right to defend yourself. And this is what she did. She was guided the French, guiding the French people into their own freedom. To do what? To balance the vibrations on planet Earth. Because no one dictatorship has the right to stay in power forever. There is always justice at the end of the tunnel. At the end of the tunnel, there is always a light. So there is a limit for evil. Sooner or later, cosmic justice will, you know, participate in the liberation of those who deserve to be free. You see? So essentially, the dramatic art, these, these superior beings, even Jesus Christ, before he reincarnated on earth as Joshua ben, Pan ben Pandira, he was already resurrected before. He decided instead of staying in the highest of the highest, because he was a habitant of the absolute, he descended here and he became a Immortal, he could have failed in his task, in his mission, but he didn't. There is a movie made by Martin Scorsese called The Last Temptation of Jesus Christ. There it shows, you know, that he was tempted because he became mortal. But because he passed all the tests given to him by his own divine father, superior beings than Jesus Christ, and he passed all the tests, and then, when he died, he could resurrect again. You see? So, this is the situation. When we learn this kind of Gnostic art applied into the dramatic arts, if you're an actor, you don't need to be an actor. You know, you are here on Earth. You know, this is something I was going to explain a little bit later. And you're asking me for now an answer. Mm -hmm. But it's okay. It's okay. So... Basically there, you know, we have to understand clearly that if we really care about ascending, to stop being 
a slave. Because when we have the ego and we are happy with the ego, we are the slaves of our own ego, of our own defects, our own vices, our own limitations, our own apocalyptic beast that makes us act like animals, intellectual animals, instead of real humans. You see the point? So if we really aspire to the final liberation, to be free, we have to get rid of the ego. Because the ego wasn't given to us by the divinity. It wasn't given to us by God. It's something that we created ourselves through a wrongdoing. You see, and that wrongdoing, people confuse the ego with personality. This is why we gave a lecture before. Personality had been given to us by the universe, by nature, by mother nature. So personality is okay because it's the vehicle to communicate. But the ego is something that we should have never developed. But also, even when we develop it, it's part of the school of life. We are here to learn something. So coming back, you know, into Hollywood and, and the training of these uh, actors, if we compare the performance, you know, between these European actors who studied Stanislavski, where you need the purpose of life is awakening consciousness. And this character, Hannibal, this psychiatrist that was crazy 100% or maybe a thousand percent, <laughs> it was a habitant of inferno. Even he was so evil, there was part of himself that wanted to cooperate with the police to capture other criminals. What is that? Isn't it a tiny little spark of light within a monster? You see? So this is something that we should never forget. We should never ignore that within the most evil people, there is always hope. There is hope. So this character, you know, and this is why Samaelon Veorja said, within saints, within saints, when they learn to explore themselves, they discover a lot of evil, very much hidden within themselves. And also, evil individuals, perverse individuals, sometimes people who kill other people with pleasure, but they will never kill their mother because they love their mother. They respect their mother. You see? So that person is not lost completely. It's very much lost. But this, there is a tiny little hope that that individual could reverse the situation through repentance, of course. It's important to understand clearly why Stanislavski method is different than method acting and why the Greek theater is different to the other two. Because in reality, you know, I remember I saw a movie, I forgot the title, between Sean Penn and Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman is a British actor. Gary Oldman portrayed the character of Beethoven, an a majestic, a majestic performance. But the trouble is with Hollywood and European producers, they want to sell a product. And of course, you know, a perfect Beethoven is not good. It's good to portray a Beethoven that also made mistakes who had a sad life, who lived a tragic kind of life, you know. He married apparently three or four times because all his wives walk away from him. But in reality, according to Gnostic anthropology and according to Samuel Veor, Beethoven is an angel, he's a superior being who is very much connected with superior kind of music, a person who lives in heaven already. And, you know, same thing with also not only Beethoven, but also Mozart. Mozart is another superior being. There were people capable of creating classical music because they had the superior capability to listen to the music that makes planets dance within the cosmos. Did you know that the sound, cosmic sound, makes planets dance? Not only planets, our atomic particles are also dancing. When our blood is moving within our organism, the blood is also dancing. When the particles around the center of the nucleus of an atomic particle, these particles are outside, are also dancing. Planets are dancing around their suns, their stars, because of sound, because of cosmic music. That we cannot perceive it, but some people can do it. Composers normally 
when they get inspiration to compose a musical piece, even if it is a popular, popular music, they get that kind of talent, that kind of capability that allows them to create sound, to organize sound, because music is sound organized according to the seven musical notes, and they can compose, you know, all kind of pieces. So coming back into Gary Oldman and Sean Penn, a British actor who studied in Europe, and Sean Penn studied in Hollywood, method acting, and Gary Oldman studied in Europe, the Stanislavski method. With all respect for Sean Penn, he's an amazing good actor, and Gary Oldman is an incredible good actor, working together. Sean Penn portrayed the character of a police officer, an undercover police officer, and Gary Oldman was a criminal, a career criminal. And they used to be friends in their childhood. They grew up together. And Sean Penn went away to another state, and he ended up becoming a police officer. And he was sent back to the place where he was born and grew up, and he met this old friend, portrayed by Gary Oldman. I'm telling you, I, I, of course, I recognize that I can make mistakes in my perception of what I saw. But to me, Gary Oldman was 10 times better than Sean Penn. The police officer that was an undercover police officer did a good job. I cannot deny that. But Gary Oldman, as a, as a criminal and best friend with Sean Penn, was amazing, was incredible. Incredible, incredible. The bad guy loved his friend, the police officer, without knowing that he was an undercover police officer. But he loved him so much that at the end of the, of the story, he gives his life for his friend. <laughs> the criminal career man died for a police officer that was his best friend, without knowing that he was an undercover police officer. There you can see, that's a beautiful message to humanity, portrayed by two great actors, one who studied method acting in Hollywood and the other who studied Stanislavski method in Europe. Both are good, but there are levels and levels of quality, levels and levels of excellence. But again, the Greek theater is the highest of the highest regarding dramatic arts, because the Greek actor, the Greek performer, thousands of years ago, you know, we spoke before about the four columns of knowledge, Gnostic anthropology is based on the Greek anthropology, the four columns of knowledge, science, philosophy, art, and mysticism, studies of comparative religions. So one of them is the arts. We are talking today about Gnosis and the arts. Well, Greek actors, Greek performers, they were telling the truth to the audiences in the Greek theater. They were telling their own dramas, comedies, and tragedies to the audience. But they were, they were true stories. They were reality. So then the audience could see how someone was confessing their mistakes, their errors, their ego to the audience and to the universe at the same time and to themselves. You see, they were exposing themselves to be criticized, to be attacked. You see, to disagree with them. When somebody was saying, well, you see, I made my wife suffer. She loved me so much and I didn't care because I had lovers, not only my wife, I had many other women in my life. And I made her suffer and I didn't care until she died. She died because she was sad. She was disappointed with me. And after she died, I realized how much I loved her how many mistakes I committed, because no one of those other women was as good as she was. I killed her. I made her suffer. I became a criminal. How could I do that? And she was telling, you know, in the Greek theater, confessing his mistakes, his errors, his sins, to a, a crowd, to the crowd, to the audience, then the audience could compare what they were listening and watching with their own personal experiences. And then they all learned from each other. And their purpose was Gnostic anthropology or awakening 
consciousness, awakening our soul. And if we don't have a soul because we have too much ego, learning to rebuild our soul, to create our soul by learning to annihilate our errors, our mistakes, our vices, our weaknesses, our ego. You see? So that was the purpose of the Greek theater. Anything wrong with it? And based on that, Stanislavski, Shakespeare learned from it, and method acting in Hollywood also learned from them. Also learned from them. And we still have a lot of quality coming from that influence in our movies, in our theater. Because isn't it better to experience a moment of truth than telling lies to the others and to ourselves? When you are a villain, when we are villains, we enjoy telling lies. We enjoy telling lies to the others and telling lies to ourselves. So we live in a constant stage of subconsciousness, unconsciousness, infraconsciousness, because we don't realize the, loss, the law of cause and effect. When we have the psychology of a villain, we contribute to create other villains. We bring to our children a bad influence. If you are a boss in a company, and you act as a villain, you think as a villain, you feel as a villain, you transmit that bad influence to your workers. If you are a politician, and you are a corrupt politician, if you are a police officer and you are a corrupt police officer, what are we doing to our lives? Not only as an individual, but also as a collective society. You see, and we've been here many, many lifetimes. This is not the only lifetime. This is the end of a cycle. That's a different situation. Mother Nature is recycling. It means that at the end of a cycle, we all have to render account. And of course, Mother Nature will bring the balance again. The balance, the equilibrium, justice will be restored on Earth. So instead of contributing to create paradise on Earth, we have done the opposite. We have created what? We have created Inferno. So what about some directors? The best Hollywood directors applying the same technique. James Cameron, a Canadian filmmaker, his movies are incredible. There you can see in a movie, you know, this film about Titanic. We all knew the story. Everybody knew the tragedy of Titanic, everybody. Making a movie about that was committing suicide. <laughs> Because when you know the story, who wants to see it again? Come on, you know. Either you're crazy or you're a genius. James Cameron proved that he was a genius in that specific movie. Because he rebuilt the story, he created a love story. That was the most important part of the story. Because in that love story, he showed how a man and a woman, they learned to love each other so much that they were ready to die for each other, if that was the case. This is true love. Who can experience true love today? Would you die for your wife? Would you die for your girlfriend? If you are a woman, would you die for your boyfriend? Would you die for your husband? Maybe you are a father or a mother. Maybe you would die for your children. Who died for other people today? Who is ready to die for other people? With all respect, almost nobody. Almost nobody. It's not my business. Why should I care about other people? You see, and this is the point. All founders of all religions, they die for us. They manifested true love. Very few political leaders in human history did something similar. And in this movie made by James Cameron that applied the same technique, the same knowledge, the same dramatic arts based on Stanislavski, based on method acting, based on Shakespeare, and based on the Greek theater, exploring the truth and beauty and perfection at the same time. People, I know people who went to see Titanic. Do you know? This is, I'm, I'm not joking. I know some people who went to see Titanic 17 times. I saw it only twice or maybe three times because I invited some relatives to see it, to hear their opinion after I saw it. But I have to confess, the beauty of the love story was the, the most important part of the movie. 
they spent a fortune making that movie, more than $200 million. At that time, it was too much money. Maybe the most expensive movie made at that time. But James Cameron had the vision, you know, to see what he did. And when the girl came to rescue the boy and the water was coming up and she risked her life and her relationship with a powerful, you know, man, she contributed to save his life. And then they could escape together to the top of the, of the boat that was sinking in the ocean near Canada here. And the situation is after that, when everybody was in the water, in the frozen water, freezing water, and people were dying because of that. People who survived to the sinking, but they died later frozen, you know, in the middle of the ocean. And the, the young man who adored his girlfriend died for her. He made sure that he was in better condition than he was going to be. He decided to stay in the, in the freezing water and he fell asleep in the water and he died. He died for her. You know, if we go into esoteric knowledge, ancient Egypt, Hermes Trismegistus, a Christified superior being. He's the one who guided you need the ancient Egyptian religion. He wrote a book called The Table of Emeralds. There, in a, in a sentence, he describes love. He said, the highest of the highest of the highest of wisdom and consciousness is love. Love is wisdom. Love is consciousness. But in its highest expression, that we can never ever imagine. So those who are capable of dying for others because of love is because they have learned to be wise and they have learned to be conscious. So awakening consciousness, isn't it a must for all of us? Because if we awaken our consciousness, we will be able to learn to love. Have we learned to love? Oh, everybody says, yes, I love you, I love you, but I hate you tomorrow. Are we, you know, are we serious or are we just clowns, puppets, puppets of our own ego, of our own dark side? You see the point? So what about the Steven Spielberg, another brilliant filmmaker who is also using Stanislavski? What about Martin Scorsese? Again, Martin Scorsese, he made that mo movie called The Last Temptation of Christ. Martin Scorsese is a Catholic individual. And he had the courage to face, to face the Catholic Church, who disagreed with his film. I remember many people, many people were marching on the streets of principal cities of the world against the movie. But he made the movie anyway. Do you know why? Because that movie was based on a book written by a European journalist who said that he had an experience he had a mystical experience. He met one of the disciples of Jesus Christ who appeared to him and he said that was Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Jesus Christ. And that mystical experience told him that Judas Iscariot wasn't a traitor to Jesus Christ. He did it because Jesus Christ told him to do it, to portray a drama. Listen to this to portray a cosmic drama, to teach humanity that where we are greedy is because we become traitors to spiritual principles. And we can betray our family members. We can even betray our God. Isn't it what we are doing today? People who go to church in different religions. But when the time comes to make money, oh, business are business. Isn't it true? Allow me to talk to you Ladies and gentlemen, who are in a position of power, maybe you're a billionaire, maybe you're a trillionaire. Have you ever thought about this? You say you're a Christian, you're a Jew, you're a Buddhist. Are you really what you say you are? Or are we, all of us, betraying Jesus Christ or Moses or Buddha or any other prophet? Allow me respectfully to invite you to meditate about that. Why not? You know, we are all brothers and sisters. Maybe I'm a baby brother, but I have the right to, you know, speak up. 
So this is interesting, you know, how Stanislavski method, Shakespeare method acting and the Greek theater are bringing us a different approach into the arts. Instead of searching for darkness, isn't it better to search for the light? Because we all descended from the light. Isn't it true? We descended from the absolute, the spiritual universe, you see? So, and here we are. If we remember Shakespeare's words, Shakespeare has said, life is a great stage where we are all performers. Isn't it true? So life is a drama, and the drama, according to Gnostic anthropology, according to Samael Onveor, founder of Gnostic anthropology, he has said that we live a drama because we have an ego. Drama means contradiction. You see, the duality of life. Yes, 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 no, no, no. You know, remember this, the absolute is one, oneness. So oneness the real being of all beings, the cosmic common being. We could also say the cosmic common father-mother because it's higher than male and female. Created the duality to create the universe. The duality is the spirit and matter. The spirit is the masculine aspect, the Holy Spirit. And matter is a word that comes from Latin that means mother, mother universe. Mother Nature, Mother Earth. All mothers who have children, they are all connected with this force that descended from the Absolute, the homeland of God, the homeland of the Spirit, the spiritual universe. So we were all planted here to experience this duality, this conflict, these dramas, comedies and tragedies, to learn from the school of life. Isn't a life a school? What's above is below. What below is above. What's within is outside. What's outside is within. The same way we go to school here to learn to write and read. Then we go to a higher levels, high school, universities, postgraduate, master degrees, PhDs, university professor, whatever. Same thing happens within the universe. There are superior beings that are higher hierarchies. They are not a species anymore. We are the highest species because higher than us there is no more evolution. We are the highest link to evolution. Higher than us there is no more evolution. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember my words. So if we want to go higher than we are, evolution won't take us there. So those people who are very intellectual, who have fallen in love with evolution, with all respect, we will never ascend into higher levels of consciousness through evolution. We need to get there through a tremendous sacrifice called revolution of consciousness. And this is what the superior beings have done. Jesus Christ, Moses, Buddha, Krishna, etc., etc. They all have done that. They all ascended from our poor level into who they have become. Not through evolution, through a tremendous psychological revolution, a revolution of the soul, revolution of consciousness. You see, so basically, when Shakespeare has said, life is a great stage where we are all performers, we've been planted here to experience the drama of life. God, the divinity, the being of all beings, the cosmic father mother, knew that we were going to have trouble here, but those troubles have been already anticipated. This is why there is heaven and there are infernos. If we are good students of life, we will deserve to go to a higher level to become a habitant of heaven. Or if we are lousy students of life, we will deserve only to go to a place called Inferno, where we are all going to be cleansed, did you know that? Purified of our ego through what we call the second death in Inferno. So Inferno has been created by the divinity, by Mother Nature. Nine heavens and nine infernos. You see, and number nine is very important. Number nine esoterically means the ninth is fear, 
connected with sex. Sexuality. Sex is a stairway to heaven or is a stairway to inferno, a stairway to hell. So if we haven't created paradise on earth, it's because sex has a lot to do with it. Are we aware that there is a, a true human sexuality based on true love, where people learn to love and adore each other? The one who loves more and more and more and the one who loves better and better and better. But most of people today have sex as a sport to collect, you know, adventures. Oh, yes. How many women have I had in my life? You know, oh, I can. I forgot how many. And then I'm a hero before the eyes of my friends, you know. Women are making the same kind of dramatic situation. How many men have they had, you know? And this is the situation, you know. We are eventually, we'll be talking more and more clearly about sexuality. But remember my words, sex is a stairway to heaven or is a stairway to hell. If there is hell on earth today, it's because sexuality has a lot to do with it. Do we know how to make love? Of course not. We know how to have sex the animal way, imitating animals, but do we really know how to make love to become one with God within the sexual act? This is why, you know, Moses was totally correct when he, in the Ten Commandments, the Sixth Commandment spoke about fornication, and the ninth commandment, which is adultery, having more than a sexual partner. To understand Moses better, it's good to pay a visit to the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. There he explains more clearly what's fornication and what's adultery. I would recommend that you go there and study that, because that has a lot to do with the drama of life today. Now, when we said that the duality of life is because of there is a confrontation between spirit and matter and the purpose of life was never to create a confrontation on the contrary the purpose of drama is to teach us to become one again to develop oneness then we will be able to return to the absolute melting spirit and matter in a few words helping our own matter our own vehicles of the spirit, our body, our emotions, our mind, our soul, to ascend into the spirit. How? Learning to, learning to spiritualize matter. And art, the arts are one way that we can choose. You see? So if we learn to spiritualize matter, the most important element there is ego. Because ego is the most aspect of the inferior matter is the animal psychology, which is holding us back within the animal kingdom. We say we're humans, we're not. We're just intellectual animals. As long as we carry the ego within, because it's the animal psychology. Me, 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 me. Instead of we are all important. Instead of learning to love, you know, we develop the opposite, which is hatred. In different levels. So coming back into this, you know, so when Shakespeare has said life is a great stage where we are all performers, there we perform our own characters. Are we a hero? Am I a hero? Am I a villain? Maybe I'm a hero 10% of my life. Am I a villain then 90%? What if I am 97% villain and only 3% hero? Do you know that when we are performing our own drama on the stage of life, I'm performing my own leading character. <laughs> are we aware of that? I'm the leading character of my own life. All the others are supporting characters. You see, sir? they are not as, as important as I am. I'm the leading character. So should I continue being a villain if I am a villain? Shouldn't I learn from life to become a good student of life? To learn to become a hero instead of a villain? Instead of contributing to create hell on earth? Shouldn't I be able to contribute to create paradise on earth? Because that was the original purpose of creating planet earth and creating life on, 
within the universe. You see the point? So this is the importance of Shakespeare, the importance of Stanislavski, even method acting or understanding better that we are all actors and actresses within the stage of life, but learn to be a hero instead of a villain. Stanislavski says something very interesting. He said, if we want to become a great actor, you have to learn to become first a great human being. That's an interesting sentence given to us by a Russian man that has been very much ignored in Hollywood because how can a Russian man teach Americans how to behave, you know? You see the point? Europeans were less complicated about it. But here in this part of the world, oh, that man, you know, he lived a hundred years ago. Ah, come on, you know. We live in a more modern time. We don't need this kind of philosophies any longer, but in reality, we have to accept he was very much enlightened, very much conscious about reality. Even in his books, he described that he was searching for beauty and perfection through dramatic art. He was searching for the light, awakening consciousness, the way the ancient Greek theater did at that time, at that ancient time. So some people would say, oh, the ancient Greek lived thousands of years ago. How can we learn from them? You know, they were less evolved than we are today. With all respect, they were more evolved because evolution moves in cycles. Are we evolving today? No, we're not. We are devolving. Half of the wheel of time is evolution and ascension. The other half is not evolution anymore. It's not ascension anymore. It's a descension, returning to the original point, like generation and degeneration. You see the point? Have we entered into degeneration then? The answer is yes, 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 yes. It's a sad perception of reality, but we have entered into degeneration. Where is the way out? Where is the way out? There is a superior cosmic law. We said it already. A revolution of the soul, because evolution is not enough. If we want to go high again, we have to get out of the will of time. The will of samsara of the ancient Egyptians. The will of ascension and descension, which is revolution of our soul consciousness. Revolution means regeneration. To accept that we are mistaken and to correct ourselves, to change, to change. Many people today, they speak about, you know, I'm going to do some little touching the surface, you know, in politics, in social life, economic life. But m very few people are ready to make changes, deep changes. They're changing our way of thinking. You see, that's a revolution. Real revolution are psychological revolutions where we are determined to become heroes instead of continue being villains. But you know, even the universe is helping us to get there. This is why Mother Nature created death. Mother Nature, the absolute, created life and death. We said that before in another lecture, there are three kinds of death, physical death, second death, mystical death. Listen to this, please. Why physical death is a reality? because it's a way of blocking evil. You can become the most powerful man on earth, but if you're immortal, at the moment of death, you're not as important as you used to be. You're going to a parallel dimension. You're not here anymore. You can leave a legacy, maybe very powerful, but you won't be there to control what you were controlling before. You see? And if you were a very evil person, well, you're being blocked by Mother Nation. If you were a a chief of villains, well, somebody will have to replace you. Maybe it won't be as good as you used to be. So when we go as a villain to a parallel dimension, you, you're not going to go to heaven. That's a big illusion of many people who say everybody goes to heaven. You know, that's a big, big, big wrong conception of reality. I'm telling you with all respect, almost nobody goes to heaven today because we have ego. Maybe you can get a holiday in heaven if you were a good person, then your ego will have to stay outside because the ego cannot enter into heaven. 
If your ego is too strong, there is no way you are going to go into heaven, not even for the holiday. Then you will have to go downstairs to the inferior dimensions, infra dimensions, or infernos, nine infernos. There, the purpose is to experience the second death. There, Mother Nature will cleanse our soul from our errors, vices. How is it going to happen? You know, the drama will continue downstairs because there, the superior beings who are ruling this part of the universe, the hierarchies, will be showing you, you will be experiencing, you are going to be experiencing they will show you the memories of nature, the Akashic records, where you will see yourself committing all kinds of errors, vices, atrocities, perversities, and they will show you how much pain you caused to other people. And your soul will be taken into the soul of those who you, that you may suffer. You will experience the pain that you caused, pain by pain. In many lifetimes, can you imagine if in this lifetime there is so much pain? Can you imagine in more than a hundred lifetimes, which is a cycle, hundred and eight lifetimes? You see the point? So there you will be cleansed, cleansing, cleansing of the soul. And there you experience the second death because the ego will be annihilated. Downstairs, but this is a horrible, painful experience. That's another drama. That's also another tragedy because you will experience another death. The second death. It won't be the physical death because you don't have a physical body any longer. It will be a death of the ego that wasn't provided to you by Mother Nature. We created it through a wrong creation. Don't confuse it with personality. There is another kind of death which is mystical death. And this is the conscious struggle within ourselves, our own inner drama between our own inner light and our own darkness within. We created our own darkness. It wasn't given to us by Mother Nature or our own spirit. It, was, it is our test within the school of life, you see? And this is an exam that we have to pass. And most of the time, we never pass it. This is what we are give, being given many lifetimes to be able to learn to ascend instead of continue descending and descending and descending in every lifetime. So this is extremely important. So mystical death means that we make the decision to stop being a villain we want to learn to be a hero. I'm not talking about a hero who goes to the battlefield, the soldier, and comes back with a lot of medals on his chest or her chest after he killed or she killed a lot of civilians. And they call them heroes. And they say that the medal proves it. No, I'm talking about a different kind of hero. The real heroes are the ones who have learned to annihilate their own inner demons. That's the real hero. So this is the mystical death. Learning, learning to ascend on purpose, no matter the troubles. So basically, you know, we are here to learn to ascend. We are here to learn to become one again, to reach oneness here. It means learning to spiritualize matter, to spiritualize my physical body, because my body it's a magnificent laboratory, but it's at the same time a temple of God, a magnificent temple. If I never forget that, but my temple had been invaded by dark forces. This is why Jesus Christ was expelling the merchants of the temple, teaching humanity, teaching us all to expel our demons from our mind. The ego is the cause of all illnesses. So when we annihilate the ego, we will reach health, physical health, mental health, emotional health. So this is why learning to spiritualize our matter will allow us to ascend into a level where we can create a cause, a consciousness, a soul. And that soul, which is closer to the spirit, will be able to reach 
our own spirit, God within, to reach oneness before the end of times. So this is it. I don't want to talk too much. And we are here to awaken awakening consciousness. That's the purpose of life. And if we can do it through the arts, this is a great task that we are all going to learn to face through any kind of art. You know, this is why there is a classical music. There is a classical art, which is a spiritual artistic form. Nothing wrong with it. Pop music, pop art is also good. It's also important, but it's also a level. If we learn to ascend into higher levels of consciousness, we will be able to improve our perception of beauty and reality, beauty and perfection, to learn to contribute, to improve life on earth. And instead of reinforcing inferno amongst us, shouldn't we learn to create paradise on earth? Well, you've been listening to Gnostic Lectures. This is Lecture 27, Gnosis and the Arts. My host today, Mr. E. Jim J. Ross. Thank you, Jim. My pleasure, Rick. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Thanks to our listeners for your patience to listen, to be with us. My name is Richard Rucroft. The website is rickyradio.com. And, of course, a email at gnosticradio at gmail.com. Thank you, and we'll catch you next time.